Welcome to Thrive Church. I am so excited to see you here today. And, uh, you know, we are uh, just so honored to have you here worshiping with us together. Are you excited to be here? Okay, I am too. You know, this is the highlight of my week, uh, to gather together. And if you don't know me, I'm Judah, lead pastor here at Thrive. And, uh, and we are uh, actually going to be uh, starting a new series uh, this week. Uh, but before we talk about that, I just want to, to give you a little update about what's going on in New Britain. Uh, many of you know that we're going to be launching a new campus in uh, New Britain. And there's many ways that you can get involved. Uh, maybe you want to get involved uh, by serving there. Maybe you have friends or family that's there. And, and if that's the case, you can go to uh, thrive.church slash NB, and you can get involved with the launch team of what's going to be going on there. But also, uh, as a result of that, we are always looking for more people to get involved serving here at Thrive at, all, at both of our locations. So if you're interested in getting involved, uh, we'd encourage you to do so. But also, uh, we are going to be uh, taking up a collection in a couple of weeks uh, to kind of fund the launch of this. So I would just encourage you, you know, we don't, we don't normally ask for money or anything like that. But, you know, as we are moving forward, this is actually an opportunity for you to invest in what God is doing in our state and his kingdom uh, coming and the gospel being spread in that city. So in about two weeks, we're going to be uh, doing a collection for that. So I'd encourage you to be praying and seeking God uh, if he would have you to contribute financially towards that. So we are starting, uh, as I mentioned, a, a new series called Finding Peace, finding peace. You know, around this time of the year, Christmas time of the year, we talk a lot about peace, peace on earth, goodwill to men. We talk about Jesus being the, the prince of peace. But do you have peace in your life? Do you really have peace? I, if you have young children, you probably are saying, no, no, I have, I have no peace in my life at all. But do we have peace in our life? Do we have peace from our past? Do we have peace from the, the wounds that we carry in our souls and in our minds and in our emotions? Do we have peace from the scars that we have? Do we have peace from the sin that weighs us down? Have you ever felt weighed down by your past? Maybe there's things in your distant past that weigh you down. Maybe there's things in your recent past that weigh you down. Maybe there's things from the last couple of days that weigh you down. Things that you've done that you know displease God and these are weighing you down. The decisions that we make in our life can have lasting effects on who we are. And not just the decisions that we make, honestly, but sometimes it's the things that were done to us as well. The words that were said to us, the actions that have come against us, these things can cause trouble in our life that can cause wounds and scars in our life. And then we can feel like our past is following us. You feel like your past is following you. Maybe you feel like your past is, is haunting you. Now we all have some regrets. We all have things that, that we wish we could have done differently. Things that we wish we handled better. Words that we wish we didn't say. We, we, we wish we could go back and, and redo some of the damage of these mistakes. Actions that we wish we could bury. Wish we could go back and, and just change the past. We wish, we wish that we could have peace from our past that haunts us. In Luke chapter 1, verse 78, it says, Because of God's tender mercy, the morning light from heaven is about to break upon us to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death and to guide us to the path of peace. This was part of a song sung by the priest Zechariah after his son John, who we would later come to know as John the Baptist was born. And, and, and if you know anything about John, he was the one that was coming to announce the way of the Messiah. And here is his father saying, because of God's tender mercy, the morning light is about to break, to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, and to guide us in the path of peace. To guide us in the path of peace. If you're taking notes, you can write this down, that, that God's mercy is our path to peace. He says here, because of God's tender mercy, it will guide us into the path 
of peace. See, mercy is what shatters the power of sin. Mercy is what defeats sin in our life. Mercy, God's mercy to us, is what forgives us and gives us the opportunity to be made right with God. God alone has the power to break the strongholds of sin in our life, to set us free from the bondage of the things in our past that hold us back. God's mercy is what brings us peace with God. Now, we've all sinned. Scripture says that all have sinned and all have fallen short of God's standard. None of us measure up. None of us are good enough to be approved by God by our good deeds alone. All of us have ghosts in our past. We all have skeletons in our closet, things that we wish we could forget about, things that haunt us day in and day out, and we realize that there is no way for us to work off all of the bad things that we've done because the debt is too great. The wrongs that we've committed are too great. And if God had not come, there would be no hope for you and no hope for me, but he has come. He's come by sending his son, Jesus, to bring us forgiveness, to bring us healing from our past. It says in Romans 5, 8, but God showed his great love for us by sending Christ. See, God showed his love by sending Christ, the Prince of Peace, the Lord of Lords, the one who comes to bring peace into your life and into my life, not peace like the world talks about. This is not that kind of peace. This is a peace from God, a peace with God. God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. While we were, isn't that amazing? I don't know why in church sometimes we get this all twisted around and we think that we have to clean up our act in order to come to God. I've invited people to come to church before. They say, well, I can't come there because I have all these things in my past. I need to clean up my act first. And that's not what Jesus says. He doesn't say clean up your act and come to me. He says, I died for you while you were still a sinner. Come just as you are. Come to me and I will will forgive your sins. I will give you the rest. He came to die for us while we were still sinners. See, God loves you so much that he offers you mercy. He offers you the power to be free from sin. And even now, whatever situation you may face, whatever is in your past, however far or however recent, when God looks at you, he loves you. And he sees you as faultless. He sees you as blameless in his sight. In your notes, mercy breaks the power of sin in our life. God's mercy to us has the power to break free the sin. God's mercy, which is new each and every day, God's mercy to us breaks the power of sin. And God wants to give you peace from your past. You were dead in your sins, but now God wants to bring you peace. He wants to give you life, as it says in Colossians 2.13. He says, you were dead because of your sins, and because of your sinful nature was not cut away yet. But then God made you alive with Christ. God wants to make you alive. He wants to set you free from your past. He wants to set you free from the things that are weighing you down in your life, from the guilt, from the shame, from the anxiety and the depression. He wants to make you alive with Christ for he forgave all of your sins. He canceled the record of the charges against us. See, there was accusations that have come against us. There was charges that came against us, and these were accurate, saying, here's what this person did. They do not live up to God's standard, but he says he canceled the record of the charges against us, and he took it away by nailing it to the cross. In this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authority. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. We all have things in our life that have, that have cut us deeply that have cut us deeply, and, and some things are so severe. In fact, many of us have had things physically that have cut us deeply. And when you get a cut in your body, sometimes the, the cut is so deep that it will heal up and the pain goes away, but what does it leave behind? A scar. Does anybody here have any scars? 
Okay, almost everybody. You know, I, I mean, th this is a question now. I don't know how, how girls talk about this, but whenever the topic of scars come up with guys, I mean, I mean, this is like a bragging party, right? Like, like we could talk for hours and hours about scars, right? I mean, any guy ever like like to brag about your scars? Okay, a couple of you guys like to brag. You know, we love to brag about you know what what we went through, and, and we have scars. I, I got a, I have a couple of scars. Um, one is on my knee. I was trying to figure out a way to show you, but it wouldn't be appropriate. Um, but, but I have a scar on my knee. It looks like a frown. It's an upside down uh, like thing right there, like a frown. And, and what happened, I was a, a kid and I was running and I was getting ready to, to jump onto the porch. And, and back then, I, I never walked anywhere. I ran everywhere. In fact, I still kind of do that now. And, and, and I would run and I was running and I was just gonna jump over all the steps. There was about four steps. I was gonna jump over all the steps onto the porch, and as I launched off the ground, something happened, and my foot slipped as I was launching off the ground, and I did not clear all of the steps, but I hit the corner of one of the steps, and I felt this thud, and I was like, huh, that didn't feel so good, and I got up, and I kind of walked it off until I looked down, and I could see my kneecap, and, and I'm like, this is not a good thing, and, and, and I'm like, like, what do I do now, and, um, and, and so I was taken to the emergency room, I ended up getting 17 stitches in my knee, and, and I looked back at that, and, and you know what, as a kid, I believe I was in fifth grade at the time, I could not wait to get the bandage off to show off this scar to my friends. I have another scar on my finger, uh, you can't really see it that well. I was out, uh, backpacking with my dad when I was a, a kid. And, uh, and, and as we were backpacking, I, I started doing some whittling on a stick. And I had a stick and I was holding it like this with my finger wrapped around the top of the stick as I was cutting the stick. And the knife slipped and it stopped cutting the stick and it went right into my finger. And so my dad got to do what he loves to do best, which is first aid out in the wild. I mean, he absolutely loves it. He's like, oh, let's look at this. I'm like, dad, can we just put a bandage on it? And, uh, and, and he loved it. And, uh, but, but I look at that and I look at that and I'm like, well, that was my, my irresponsibility. I didn't really know how to use a knife well. And, and I was doing something foolish and I, and I have this scar. In our lives, scars can be like, like these two kind of scars I just described. Some of them is something that kind of happens accidentally to us and some of them are self-inflicted. Some of the scars are self-inflicted. Some of the scars are, are things that I did that, that I shouldn't have done, but now I suffer the consequences. Some are just out of our control. Now we have physical scars like these, which we can see, but there's also invisible scars that come from inner wounds. And we wish these scars would go away. These are things in our past, but it all comes back, back to, to forgiveness. See, forgiveness is the key to experiencing peace from our past. See, we need to receive forgiveness for God, from God, for the things that we have done that have displeased him, that have gone against his command. But we also need to be willing to forgive others who have hurt us in the past. In your notes, you can write down that God's mercy will heal all wounds. They'll heal wounds that, that we have created, but they'll also heal the wounds that have come against us. And we need to reflect God's mercy to other people. And this can be a difficult thing because maybe you are a victim of something in your life. Maybe you are a victim of, of abuse, or maybe somebody cheated you, or somebody lied to you, or stole something from you. Maybe you were a victim and things happened to you and it cut you deeply. People say, time heals all wounds. Does anybody even really believe that? I mean, time heals all wounds. I know people who are still hurting from something that happened 30 years ago because they've never allowed it to heal, still experiencing pain. See, Jesus is the one who heals all wounds, not time, but we need to learn how to accept God's forgiveness into our life, but then also how to forgive other people. And we have these scars. Scars that remind us of what we've gone through. Maybe there's someone that you need to forgive. Maybe there's somebody that you need to, to offer some mercy to. And as you think about that person, maybe there's a person that's popped into your mind right now that you need to forgive and you're not ready to. And, and I understand this is, a, this is a high challenge, but it's a high reward as well. Because by doing so, by expressing mercy to others, we get to experience God's peace. See, peace begins with forgiveness, receiving forgiveness and extending it 
to others. And God wants you to experience his peace. He is the Prince of Peace. He wants us to experience peace. In Psalm 147, verse 3, it says, He heals the brokenhearted and bandages their wounds. Maybe you've gone through something in life that's left you feeling brokenhearted. Maybe you've gone through a betrayal. Maybe you've gone through some kind of pain. Maybe there's, there's shame. And here it says that God wants to heal the brokenhearted. He wants to bandage your wounds. See, the enemy may have tried to destroy you, but God wants to heal you. God wants to bring restoration. You know, if you have a scar in your body, if you have a scar in your life, that doesn't mean that you're finished. That doesn't mean that, that, that your time is over. It simply means that you were healed from something. It, it's a reminder of God's faithfulness. In, in scripture, in the Old Testament, before Jesus came on the scene, in the Hebrew Bible, there was a man by the name of Jacob. And Jacob was, was one who was in the line to bring about God's chosen people the Israelites, the 12 tribes. And, and Jacob was the father of these 12 tribes. And as Jacob was beginning to get closer to God, he wanted to experience God in a more close and a more powerful way. And one evening, as he was there camping, an angel of the Lord came and they began to wrestle. Like, I don't know why they were wrestling to begin with, but they're wrestling, and he's wrestling with this angel, and the angel tries to get away, and Jacob is holding on him and says, I'm not gonna let you go until you bless me. I'm not gonna let you go until you bless me. And the angel reaches around, and he says he touches his hip, and from that day forward, Jacob always walked with a limp, but he got God's blessing. And sometimes we may walk through life with a limp, but we've experienced God's blessing. Just because you walk with a limp doesn't mean that you don't have God's blessing on your life. Just because you have a scar doesn't mean that you can't be successful. Just because you've gone through a breakup doesn't mean that you can't move forward and still do great things. You may think that your past limits you from the future, but your scars don't have to stop you because this is your story. This is your story. This is why we love to tell stories about our scars because like, this is what happened to me, but this is how I've been made whole. This is your story. But isn't it a relief to know that we serve God who sent Jesus to this earth and Jesus has more scars than you do. Jesus has more scars. Scripture says that he was beaten for us. He was bruised for us. They whipped his back. They, they beat a crown of thorns upon his head. They ripped his beard out. They, they pierced his hands and his feet with nails. They stuck a spear into his side. He has more scars than you do. And he died upon the cross naked and ashamed. And he was buried in a tomb. And three days later, God miraculously brought him to life again. And we celebrate that. But, but, but have you ever wondered if Jesus had the power to come back from the dead, why didn't he remove the scars on his body? Why didn't he remove the scars? He, he could have just come back and, and everything, but, but he had the scars as a reminder, as a reminder to you and a reminder to me of the price that had been paid for our mercy. See, Jesus has scars, but yet he still rose from the grave. He stands at the right hand of God. So what makes you think that your scars, that your past, may disqualify you from serving God. Because in your notes, God loves using scarred people. God loves using people who have gone through brokenness, who have gone through difficult times, who have been scarred and hurt, people who have messed up royally and yet have experienced God's forgiveness and healing. Now we want the scars to go away. We don't wanna be reminded of the hurt. We don't wanna be reminded of the sickness. We don't want to be reminded of the betrayal that we've gone through. We don't want to be reminded of these things. But in your notes, although the scars may not go away, they may not go away, but they don't have to keep you from moving forward. See, these scars, they can't hold you back 
any longer. Yes, it's something that happened in your past, and maybe it's something that we wish that we could forget, but our scars don't have to keep us from moving forward. The scars that we have are not to hold us back. The limp that we have isn't there to hold us back, but it's to remind us of the grace of God, that he still will bless you, that he still will pour favor on your life, that he is still for you. He wants to guide you, lead you, direct you, and shape you into who he wants you to be. See, I worship a savior who has scars. So as a result, I can be okay with the scars that I have. I can be okay with the things that I've done. I can be okay with the things that have happened to me because God wants to bring peace to your past. He has removed your sin, and now he wants to heal your wounds. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 12, The Apostle Paul is writing here, and he says, I don't mean to say I've already achieved all these things or that I've already reached perfection, but I press on to possess the per- perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on how many things? This one thing. Paul's saying, I'm gonna focus on one thing, and you know what that is? It's forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. Underline that, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I'm gonna forget my past and look forward to what lies ahead. I'm gonna forget the pain. I'm gonna forget the scars. I'm not gonna live in in regret any longer. I'm not gonna live in guilt and shame any longer because Christ wants to set me free. I'm focusing all my energies on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. In your notes, we forget the past, by focusing on what's in front of us. Where are we looking? Where are we looking? Where are our eyes focused on? Are our eyes focused in front of us or behind us? You're not gonna drive very well if the entire time you're driving, you're looking over your shoulder, you're watching the rear view mirror. We have to keep our eyes looking in front of us. What are you focused on? Are you focused on your past? Are you focused on your problems? Are you focused on what happened to you before? Or are you putting your focus on Jesus Christ? Putting your focus on the fact that he has a future for you he wants to direct you so stop looking back you may have some scars but that doesn't disqualify you it doesn't define you it doesn't make you into into who you are God wants to bring you further it doesn't matter where you've come from in life what matters is where you're going where are you going are you moving closer to Jesus are you forgetting your past or are we just wallowing in what happened to us wallowing in what we did. How could God love me after all that I've done? How could God forgive me? How could God love someone as broken as me? When Jesus died on the cross and he came to life again, he had these scars on his hand and scars on his side and scars on his feet. And he appeared to his closest friends, his his disciples. And he appeared to them alive and, and he showed them his scars. He said, look, I'm alive. And they couldn't believe it. Their minds are blown that this person who they saw crucified was now standing before them. But there was somebody who wasn't there, and his name was Thomas. And, 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 and Thomas, I mean, people, people criticize Thomas. like They call him Doubting Thomas because of the one reasonable thing that he actually did, right? I mean, like, like, think about it. This was reasonable. Thomas, all these other disciples came and said, Thomas, guess what? We saw Jesus, and he was alive. And Thomas is like, I don't believe you. Like, like if somebody, like we, we like to criticize someone, oh, well, uh, he, he didn't believe. Now, you wouldn't have believed it either, okay? We would have all doubted this story. And Thomas simply says, look, guys, Maybe, maybe you were just really sad and you thought you saw something. Maybe you were reminiscing. Maybe you, maybe you were just sitting around. You were overtired. You thought maybe you saw somebody you thought looked like him, but I'm not going to believe it until I see the scars, until I can put my hands, my finger, and the scars in his hands, and I can, I can touch the scar on his side. I'm not going to believe it. And it was about a week later. Jesus shows up to Thomas and doesn't criticize him. He just says, Thomas, look. Look at my scars. 
Look, put your finger here where the nail went through. Isn't that wild? Look, look at my side. It's healed up, but you can still see the scar right there. And Thomas at that moment said, yes, now I believe because I've seen the scars in your body. I believe because I've seen the scars. And maybe somebody needs to see or touch your scars before they believe. Maybe somebody needs to hear the story of your life and what God brought you through and the scars that you have to show for it. Maybe somebody needs to see that before they'll take that step of faith and believe. See, we have these scars, but this is now a story for us to tell others of how Christ has restored my life, how he's brought me through difficulty, how he's redeemed me, how he's forgiven me, and I'm not the person I used to be. There's so many stories that I could tell of people who who their, their lives are radically transformed, and then they see friends they haven't seen in years, and the friend's like, wait a minute, this is not the person I used to know. You were a screw up. You were going and doing this and that. You were, you were on drugs. You were addicted. You were doing all these things. Who are you? And he said, well, yeah, I got a lot of scars. But put your finger in the scars because I have a Savior who's healed me from these things. And I have this reminder. But this reminder is a story to tell you about what Christ has done in my life. In your notes, write this down, that your, your scars can inspire somebody to believe. So you have these scars for a reason. They can inspire somebody to believe, somebody to put their faith in Christ. See, people all around us are wounded and discouraged. People all around us are are lonely, and they don't know how they're going to make it. People all around us have no hope. And as we go into holiday time, this can can even magnify these feelings of depression and hopelessness. And so many people, not knowing where to turn, they turn to opioids. They turn to alcohol. They turn to relationships they shouldn't be in. They turn to all kinds of things. People are wounded and they don't know how they're going to make it. But when they hear your story about how God healed you, how God brought restoration, how God restored you, maybe that'll give them hope. When they see your scars, then yeah, it's in my past and I wish I didn't have to go through it. I wish I didn't do those things that I did. I wish I didn't experience the experiences that I went through that were so painful. But if God can use my scars for his glory, then let him use them. See, God didn't just show you mercy for your own sake. He didn't just allow you to have these scars for a a reminder for yourself. He has them in you for somebody else. So we say, touch my scars. Look at my scars. I'm not perfect. I've done all kinds of things. You can look at me and maybe you'll see yourself in me. That if God can heal you, if God can bring restoration, maybe he can do that in me. And what God did for us, he can do for everybody. What was meant to harm you, God turned it around for good. So let's forget the past. Let's move forward to what lies ahead because God's forgiveness is enough for you. His mercy is new every day. And if we want to walk in peace from our past, we need to experience God's mercy and forgiveness and now extend that to others and not be ashamed of our scars, not try to hide them, but show them proudly as an example of God's restoration and what he can do for you when we trust him. Let's pray. Father, we come to you now. And we thank you that even though we don't like our scars that much, we thank you that you've healed us, that you've brought restoration for us. And for those here that are in the wounded period, Lord, we ask you to bring healing, to bring freedom from the pain. Let us not look at the past any longer, but let us look forward to what you have for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus Christ and him alone. If you're here and you don't know Jesus, he died for you. He's got the scars to prove it. Many of us here have the scars to prove it, that God can use messed up people. God can use people who have been hurt. God can use people who have been abused. God can use people who have been rejected and kicked and lied to and stolen from. And God can use you too. So won't you call on him? Scripture says that if you call on his name, you'll be saved. So won't you call on him now and say, Jesus, you are my Lord.
And if you're here and you've been living in the past, let's receive God's forgiveness for the things that we've done. And let's offer forgiveness to those who've hurt us. And let's let the past stay in the past. Let's move forward. As Paul said, let's forget the past and move forward to what lies ahead. So, Lord, we ask you to lead us, to guide us, to heal us, to bring restoration, to bring healing, because we know that you have made a way. We know that you've opened up a doorway for us to get to you. We know that you have promised us that you'll never leave us and never forsake us. You've promised that you'll forgive us. You've promised that you'll heal us. You said that by your stripes we are healed that through the shedding of your blood we can be forgiven, so we walk in that now. Give us peace, O Lord, from our past, and let us move forward into what you have for us in Jesus' name. And everyone says amen and amen.